Hey, Pastor Kyle here. I just want to thank you for clicking and checking out this resource. Hey, do me a favor. If you want to keep updated with all of our live videos, Sunday morning live streams, or any other video, just click the subscribe button so you'll get notified when we go live each week. Also, if you would like to give or find out more about the ministry at Crossview Church, you can check out some of the links below the video and click there to learn more. Well, I pray that this video and this lesson be a blessing to you. I pray for your week and, and may God bless you and keep you. If you got your Bibles with you this morning, and I hope that you do, we are in the Sermon on the Mount. We're in Matthew chapter 5. Uh, we've started on this just a few weeks ago. Um, well, actually, we started on it over a year ago when we started with the Beatitudes, but we are continuing through uh, the Sermon on the Mount here. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 5. We're going to read from verses 17 through 20 this morning. When you got it, say got it. All right, I, someone over here has it. When you got it, say got it. We are weak. I'm going to give you all just a second because we don't got it yet. Everybody's scrolling on their phone. Click Matthew chapter 5, U version. You know, you had to back out of it, cancel out of it, come back into it. Some of you are re-downloading it. There's an update. So I'll wait a second. Come on, you know. Okay, Matthew chapter 5. We're going to start in verse 17. If you got it, say got it. There's everybody. All right, good to see you all this morning. So we're going to read from 17 through 20. The Word of God says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. A brief word of prayer. God, what we have not give us, what we know not teach us, and what we are not make us, to the glory of your Son and in his name, amen. As the world descends more and more into chaos, the idea of something being radical shifts. And what I mean is, as we lose control out here, the things that are order and truth, the things that come straight from the word, those things begin to, to seem more and more radical to the outside world. Just to give you an example of what I mean by radical. A radical person. How would we describe a radical person? Well, this is how the dictionary describes them. A radical person is one who advocates a thorough or complete political or social reform. Someone who holds or follows strong convictions or principles. Now, there's good and bad examples of someone who is what we would describe as radical by nature. I can think of one near and one far of someone who's radical, holding to a strong conviction, whose, whose aim is total or complete political and social reform. A near-term bad example of someone who could be labeled radical but would be rightly labeled radical would be the terrorists from 9-11. And in fact, we would call them religious extremists. We would call them radicals because they were trying to impress a reform, and, and their view of reform involved the elimination of American citizens. We were the enemy of their reform, whether it was a religious reform that they sought or simply a social reform in the agenda of world affairs. They carried out their radical plan by destroying property and killing thousands of people. That would be an example of radical behavior. But there's another kind of radical behavior, or at least what's been labeled radical in history, and I would point you to the Protestant Reformation, where the men who reformed the church were considered to be radicals of their time. Martin Luther was considered to be a radical person. In fact, we can trace 
the, the lineage of this particular church back through history to a group of people who were called the radical reformers or the Anabaptists. And they were called that because they viewed the changes needed in an in, in extreme way, or at least, if you wouldn't like to use the word extreme, they, they viewed the need for a complete reform. A complete reform. Now, this is why I say that as chaos begins to take over in different places, the things that we call radical, the things that are actually just trying to get us back to what's correct, seem to be the chaos in itself. So what, what were the reformers trying to do in the 16th century? What were they trying to do that was seen as so radical by the Roman Catholic Church, which was the church established in most of the world? What were they trying to do? Well, essentially, there were two things that the reformers were trying to get to. Two things. Now, tell me how radical you think these two things sound today. They were trying to get back to the heart of the true message of the gospel. They were trying to recover the true message of the gospel. They were trying to, to unearth it out from underneath the traditions which had, had encapsulated it and had made it hard to see or understand the true nature of the gospel of forgiveness by faith alone and Christ alone. They were trying to get there. This was considered radical because in order to do so, they had to scrub away the stuff that, that blocked the gospel from being heard and understood. This period of time where we have the darkness has descended over top of the truth of the word, we call it the dark ages, right? The dark ages where, where not only was the gospel no longer being preached thoroughly and truthfully, but even, even artistic and scientific discoveries were being squashed in this age of darkness. But there was another thing that the reformers were pressing into. And, and in fact, it's the thing that grounded their understanding of the gospel itself. They were trying to get us back to the gospel through the proclaimed word of God. So the reformers had a simple formula. They said, the way we need to understand what the true gospel is, is going back to God's word. We need to go to God's word for everything we do. We need to be able to go to God's word and point to the truthfulness of scripture. And that's what we proclaim and teach. That's where we go to understand who God is, who we are, what the gospel is, what the truth is. We have to have an objective standard. And this, my friends, was considered radical. A radical departure from the way things had operated. A radical, radical move. In fact, most people of the time didn't even have access to the scriptures. They didn't have a Bible in their homes. They certainly didn't have one on their phones. If you showed up with a phone in the 16th century, you were probably in for a torch lighting ceremony, if you know what I mean. It was not going to be good for you. We know that never happened. Getting back to the truth when the world is chaotic sounds radical. Let me say something that I would be, this is going to be dangerous, but I'm going to do it anyway. Let me say something that I think would be radical. Today, and you tell me how radical you think I'm being, I believe there are two genders. That's it. Male, female. I believe women should participate in their own sports with only women, and men should participate in their sports with only men. Radical. I'll stop there, but I think that's enough, right? It's enough. And where would I get this radical idea from? I get it right from Genesis. He created them male and female. It doesn't have dot, dot, dot after it. But this would be radical. As a matter of fact, this is now publicly online. I'm sure that, you know, if I had a following of any sort, which I don't, I'd get hate mail for it. How dare you? How radical of you to suggest that there's only male and female, to suggest that men and women are two different things. Well, I have daughters, and I want to protect them, and I want to care for them, and I don't want them to grow up in a world where any given day a person can decide, I think I'm a woman today. Now, how much 
how much does that serve them if that's the truth of what we can do? We just at any given time can decide, I just don't want to be what I am anymore, so I'm just going to tell you what I am. And then we are expected now to just surrender that to you. Well, I guess if that's your truth, then you can do what you want. Well, but that's not the truth. We're using the wrong words. That's not even truth in any sense of the term. It's like, that's your lie to yourself, my friend. And I won't be a part of that with you, but I'll share the truth with you. I'll share the truth with you. When we do that, it appears as if we're being radical. We're being radical in nature, when in fact what we're just trying to do is set an objective standard and go back to the Scriptures, back to the Word of God. Now, in the first century, as Jesus gave these words, the Sermon on the Mount, He's giving a manifesto to His people. He's giving words to His disciples, and He's teaching them. But He's teaching them in such a new and and unique way. He's teaching them about the law. He's teaching them about the Scriptures, and He's teaching them how to understand these things and how to see these things. But because he's explaining to them the truth and what he's trying to do is scrape away all of the stuff that's been piled up on top of it. He's trying to cut through the traditions of man, cut through all the little extra things that have been added over all the centuries and all the years. He's trying to say like, wait a minute, we need to get back to the truth of the word of God. And in doing so, he is called a radical. His disciples are called radical people. They're lawless people. Or at least their claim, the, the enemies of Jesus and his disciples claim that he's radical and that he's leading them in a radically different direction. That his life and his teaching are opposed to the scriptures. And in fact, what he's doing is trying to get them back to the scriptures. But you can see in the way Jesus teaches and behaves how they would at least kind of come to this conclusion. It's, it's not for nothing. Jesus speaks authoritatively, but he is, you know, he's got that perfect combination of tough and tender. He's going to deliver to them the truth. And in fact, much of the time for the religious elite of the day, that truth hurts for them. You can see that here in, in the Sermon on the Mount. He has these, these six antitheses that he delivers where he he leads off by saying something like, you have heard that it was said, but I tell you this. You might have heard that this is what it means, but I'm telling you this is what it means. Now, for the elite of the day, the people who who are saying things and who are adding things, this can come across to them as where I'm from, we'd call it fighting words. What do you mean? Jesus? You you really mean that you're going to stand here and say that we're just all wrong? And I think his answer would be, well, yeah, you've got a lot of things wrong. And you have, because of all of the things that have been been piled on top of the Word and on top of the Scriptures and on top of the the prophets and on top of the law, because you've you've encased it in all of these traditions and, and lies and false teachings, you have blocked off the truth and the true meaning of the Word of God to His people. So here I am to clarify for you. You have heard that it was said, but I tell you this. That does sound a little bit radical. It does sound a tad bit rebellious. It does sound like Jesus is coming after the false teaching. He's coming after the hypocrisy. He's coming after the traditions. And he's trying to tear those things down, tear them away, so that the people can hear the truth of the Word of God. So he recognizes this. He sees it. He understands it. So before he goes into these antitheses, which make up the bulk of the rest of chapter 5 and even in some ways, chapter 6 of, his, of the Sermon on the Mount, he gives an introductory paragraph. This is just great sermon writing, right? He captured their attention with the Beatitudes, these wonderful blessings. What a better way to get the attention of an audience than by to share the ways that they're blessed. I mean, this is, one, this is, a, this is a standard way that we would, we would do this if we want to endear ourselves and build an ethos with the audience that we're preparing to speak to. It's saying... Do you guys realize how blessed you are in the Lord? Do you know and do you know that that you don't have to be strong and powerful? You can be humble. You can be meek. You don't have to be a fighter with clenched fists. You can be a peacemaker 
and God will bless you. And this is how Jesus enters into the sermon with his people. And then, he, and then he blesses them really further by expressing to them a new identity, who they are in Christ. He says, when you follow me, when you're, when you're united to me, you are the light of the world. You're the salt of the earth. And in doing so, he's, he's drawing them into this message. Now, he knows that what he's getting ready to do is he's getting ready to speak against some of the things that they may have held as true, they may have held as beliefs. He's getting ready to speak against some of these things and tear down some of the traditions and, in fact, give them kind of a new radical understanding of the Word of God. So before he goes into that, he gives us an intro, and he says, before you hear what I'm getting ready to say, I want you to know this. I want you to know something. I have not come to abolish the law or the prophets. No, I've come to fulfill them. In fact, not a single iota, not a single dot, not an iota will be removed from the law until all things are accomplished. Heaven and earth will pass away before the law is removed. So I'm not here to take away what you've known to be the law and the prophets. And it's important for us to recognize when, he, when, they, when they say law and prophets together like that, when they say the law and the prophets, essentially this is shorthand for what we would call the Old Testament. Now there is the specific aspects of the law, which is typically the Mosaic law. Think of the, the commandments given to the nation of Israel. And there are the prophets, but when we put these things together, essentially what we're saying is all of the scriptures, all of the, what we call, Old Testament. Of course, it wasn't the Old Testament for Jesus. For Jesus, it was just the Bible. It was just the scriptures. They didn't have a New Testament yet. That would come after Christ's resurrection. That would become in post-resurrection. So this is the scriptures. And essentially, Jesus is telling us, I'm not here to get rid of the Old Testament. I'm not here to remove this and its importance. In fact, I'm here to fulfill it. In fact, I'm here to tell you that it, it remains. And so Jesus' purpose, I think, in this paragraph, in this intro to his bulk of his sermon, it can be broken down into three main purposes or three main ideas. Jesus confirms the authority of the Old Testament. Jesus fulfills the Old Testament, and he speaks on his fulfilling the Old Testament. And Jesus commends obedience to the Old Testament. Now, this morning here, I'm going I'm to be straight up with you. We are not going to get through all three of these. My goal is to get through just the first couple, and then we will come back in a couple weeks and try to get the third one. So this morning, I want us to consider the authority of the Old Testament and then Jesus' fulfillment, which is where we'll, we'll really hone in. So what does Jesus say about the authority of the Old Testament? Well, he hits on it even just in the short few sentences, multiple times, saying that heaven and earth will pass away, and not even a, an iota or a dot, not even the smallest letter of writing. For us in English, it would be the dot on the I or the cross on the T. Not even a, not even a T cross will be removed from the law before heaven and earth passes away, before all things are accomplished. And in short, what we could say is Jesus is telling us, look, you cannot get rid of the Old Testament scriptures. You can't just act like they don't exist. Now, he's telling that to the, to the Jews of his day who are still under the Old Covenant. There's this time when Jesus comes into the world where we know, we know now on this side of the cross that he's preparing to establish a new covenant with his people, through his shed blood and his broken body. However, yet he's in the world and the new covenant isn't yet established. They're still under the old covenant at this point. They're still under the law. And Jesus tells them at that point, look, you can't get rid of the law. You can't remove the law. It is still important. It's still here. There's purpose and reason and meaning behind the law. And in fact, in the New Covenant age, as the New Testament Scriptures are written, the Apostle Paul even further confirms the importance of Scripture to us. But he makes it all-inclusive to bring in the New Testament. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, he tells us that all Scripture is God-breathed, or is breathed out by God, or perhaps your, your translation says that your, the Scripture is inspired by God. 
coming from the word theonostos. This means that God literally breathes the word out. It's, if you're speaking and you hold your hand close to your mouth, you can feel the breath from your words touching your hand. This is what the word of God is. It is breathed out by God. It's inspired by God. We use two uh, maybe complicated words to understand when we describe the scriptures, all of the scriptures, we say that it is verbal, it is plenary inspiration. And what we mean by that when we say verbal isn't that God dictated out loud to everybody all of the words, but we mean that he inspired the actual words themselves. So when we read the Bible, we read a translation of the Bible. We need to recognize that they were in fact given to us in different languages, primarily Greek and Hebrew, a little bit of Aramaic, but in the exact words that were spoken, in the orders that they were spoken, in the complexities with which they were spoken, they were inspired by God. This is why Bible study, it's important for us not to just pluck things out and twist them around. We have to understand the context which with, with, with which things are spoken. We need to dig into, and, and if you learn as you grow how to do word studies, how to study the specific words given, you'll see the importance in them. In fact, sometimes you can understand a meaning from a text by digging into the actual words themselves. I would commend this to you as a way to study your Bible, to dig into the words. If you have a good study Bible, that's a start because usually they'll point to you the important ones that you need to know because not every word needs to be dug out that way. You can move into commentaries, you can move into other things, but I commend to you the, the, the rigorous study of the, of the words that are spoken. Look for the phrasing. Look for the way that the therefores are used. Look for the way that, that everything is structured and flows together. They're specifically inspired in that way for a purpose and a reason. And if we take that and flip it around, then we lose the true meaning. We lose it. We also say that they're, they're verbal, but they're plenary. In other words, plenary means in their totality, all of them, all of the words that we have preserved for us in the Scriptures, all of them, every word is inspired by God. Every word. This is, this is left to the people who are the experts in the languages, of which I am not. We have to trust them that they will go back to the original manuscripts of the languages and present us with translations that are actually true. Every translation, to an extent, has a little bit of guesswork. But we are so blessed in that we have such an ample amount of true manuscripts from the authors themselves that we can go back and, and analyze and look at all of the words and try to come up with the best understanding. And if you've ever been concerned about whether or not the Scriptures are giving you the truth about what they really meant, I would tell you this. We have more copies of the Scriptures than any other ancient book in history. In fact, if you took away all of the actual manuscripts that we have, and you only relied on the Scriptures as they have been written about by other people, we would still be able to put together all of the Scriptures. Now, that's preservation. That is preservation of the Word that's only possible by God's grace. We can trust in the authority of the Scriptures, all of them, every word, this is why we do what we do when we worship. Have you guys ever wondered why you sit here and listen to someone preach? Not me in particular, although maybe me in particular. You, you come here on Sunday mornings and you wonder, why, why do we do this particular part of Sunday mornings? Why do we do this? Well, here's the idea in its simplest form. The idea is not that you would come here and hear what I have to say on a Sunday morning about your life about how you should behave, about what you should do. Now, that would just be my best advice for you, and I joke with my wife all the time. If I get in the habit of giving you good advice, it may be great advice. However, if you follow it, what are the chances that you just end up a lot more like me? You don't want to be like me. You want to be like Christ. So what we're doing here when we hear the Word preached, it's worship because what we should be hearing is God's word proclaimed to us. And you can sit here and trust that what you're hearing isn't what some preacher had to say or my best idea or my new book or my Tony Robbins marathon of life coaching. No, what you're hearing is from God in his word, what he has spoken and what he has said. And when you hear it, you can praise him in your response to it. That's what 
That's what Sunday mornings are supposed to be. That's why we sing the word, we preach the word, we pray the word. We see the word in the ordinances. This is what we're doing. We're hearing from God. And yet today, some teachers advocate removing the Old Testament from our language. They advocate, as it has popularly been said, and maybe some of you may understand where I'm going with this, it has been popularly advocated that we should unhitch ourselves from the Old Testament, that maybe we should leave, it's time to just leave the Old Testament behind. But I would warn you in that because what Jesus says is, therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever teaches them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom. Whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. We can't simply pretend as if the Old Testament doesn't exist just because maybe we don't understand all of it. The Old Testament was given to us for a reason. The prophecies, the stories, the narratives, the history, the wisdom, the law, they were given to us for a reason, all of them, every aspect of them. And in Deuteronomy 4, in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 2, these words should be a guide to us. You shall not add to the word that I command you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God that I command to you. This doesn't just mean that you're going to go in to the scriptures and you're going to start adding in extra notes. Effectively, what Moses is commanding here is, is that you don't take the law as I've delivered it to you and then start piling on top of it all of your traditions and all of your extra expectations of people and sprinkling in your own thoughts and your own wisdom and your own life coaching. Don't do that. Take the word for what it's worth, and it's God's word. Look to it. Don't add to it. Don't pull away from it. Pour yourselves into the word. Know God's word. And look for the reasons and the ways in which it guides and directs you and helps you. So the word is important. The authority of the Old Testament and its truthfulness, its inspiration, and its permanence. But we also see, and this is, I think this is the heartbeat of this introduction, the heart of what Jesus is doing in this particular paragraph, I would venture even to say that this aspect is more important, although that may be a dangerous way to say it. I hope what you're hearing is that this is something that we have to pour ourselves over and the fact that Jesus is the fulfillment. He's not abolishing the law and the prophets. He's not abolishing and removing the Old Testament. He says, I'm fulfilling it. Now, speaking of words being inspired, the word fulfillment is a bit of a tricky one. It has some different flexible meanings to it, and it's, it's used in different ways. And, and in Matthew, it's, this, it's a particular topic to understand how does Matthew use the word fulfillment? What is he getting at? Well, to make it simpler, I think what we need to do is take a, a holistic understanding of this word and apply it through really three things. And there, there are three things, I think, that express the way that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. First of all, Jesus is the end to which everything points. If in John chapter 5, 39, he says, you search the scriptures, and he's speaking to the scribes and Pharisees, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me. The scriptures are all pointing towards Jesus Christ. In some way, the narratives, the history, the stories, the wisdom, everything somehow is working us in the direction of Jesus Christ. He is what the Old Testament is testifying to. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, he says, For all the promises of God find their yes in him. They find their yes in Christ. He is the yes to the promises given throughout the Scriptures. They're, they're wrapped up and bound up and tied to Christ and who he is. You can't have the promises fulfilled without Christ. He's the key. He's the hinge point. Secondly, Jesus fulfills the Old Testament by his right teaching. It, it could be said this way. He fills up the teaching. He brings the true meaning of the teaching. He points us to the true purpose and meaning of the law. Now, when I was a kid, I used to go on long road trips with my family. Um, we crisscrossed we criss the United States twice. Um, we moved all over the place. We typically lived in the south, so every time we came to Indiana to visit, it was a 13- or 14-hour drive. And on those drives, um, this was, you know, obviously years before iPods and, 
and iPads and I, everything else. And um, we had to listen to this thing called the radio. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of this. It's a magnificent tool. The radio, um, you, just, you just turn it on and it just, people talk to you through it. Talk radio was one of my dad and I's favorite things to listen to as I was his navigator. And one of the shows that we listened to frequently, typically late in the evenings in the drives, would be uh, a show by Paul Harvey. Is anybody familiar with who Paul Harvey is? Paul Harvey. And he used to have this show called The Rest of the Story. And he told these stories, and, and at the, kind of at the end of the story, he would bring to light something that had somehow been hidden throughout the story. So I, I'm going to depart from my standard protocol on Sunday mornings. I just want to read to you a short one so you can get the gist of, of what a Paul Harvey story was like. So I hope, I hope you enjoy this. So this is a Paul Harvey story called The Man and the Birds. This is a story of an average man, not a Scrooge, but a kind decent, and mostly good man. He was generous to his family and upright in his dealings with other men. However, he just didn't believe all that incarnation stuff, which the churches proclaim at Christmas time. It just didn't make sense, and he was too honest to pretend otherwise. He just couldn't swallow the Jesus story about God coming to earth as a man. I'm truly sorry to distress you, he told his wife, but I'm not going with you to church this Christmas Eve. He said, He'd feel like a hypocrite and that he'd much rather just stay at home, but he would wait up for them. And so he stayed home, and they went to the midnight service. Shortly after the family drove away in the car, snow began to fall. He went to the window to watch the flurries getting heavier and heavier, and then went back to his fireside chair and began to read his newspaper. Minutes later, he was startled by a thudding sound. Then another and another, a sort of thump or thud. At first, he thought someone must be throwing snowballs against his living room window. He went to the front door to investigate and found a flock of birds huddled miserably in the snow. They'd been caught in the storm and in a desperate search for shelter had tried to fly through his large landscape window. That was what had been making the sounds. Well, he couldn't let the poor creatures lie there and freeze. So he remembered the barn where his children stabled their pony. That would provide a warm shelter if he could direct the birds into it. Quickly, he put on a coat and galoshes, then tramped through the deepening snow to the barn. He opened the doors wide, turned on a light, but the birds wouldn't go in. He figured food would entice them in, so he hurried back to the house to fetch breadcrumbs. He sprinkled them on the snow, making a trail to the yellow-lighted wide-open doorway of the stable, but to his dismay, the birds ignored the breadcrumbs and continued to flap around helplessly in the snow. He tried catching them, but could not. He tried shooing them into the barn by walking around, waving his arms. Instead, they scattered in every direction except into the warm, lighted barn. And then he realized that they were afraid of him. To them, he reasoned, I'm a strange and terrifying creature. If only I could think of some way to let them know that they can trust me. If only they knew that I am not trying to hurt them, but to help them. But how? Any move he made tended to frighten them and confuse them. They just would not follow. They would not be led or shooed because they feared him. He thought to himself, If only I could be a bird and mingle with them and speak their language, then I could tell them not to be afraid, and I could show them the safe, warm barn. But I would have to be one of them so they could see, hear, and understand. At that moment, the church bells began to ring. The sound reached his ears above the sounds of the wind. He stood there listening to the bells, pealing the glad tidings of Christmas, and he sank to his knees in the snow. Now, that's the kind of story that Paul Harvey would share on his shows, and you can see the draw and the import and how the man didn't understand the incarnation But then through this simple experience with the birds and his desire to rescue them, 
he understood, well, I'd have to be a bird for them not to be terrified of me. And suddenly the truth of the incarnation began to set in his mind. And he understood, oh, maybe that's part of why God would need to come. He would need to take on human flesh. If he doesn't take on human flesh, if he doesn't suffer as we suffer, if he doesn't know this world as we know this world, then can he truly say, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest? Would we believe him? Would we trust him? Would we walk into his open arms? Now Jesus says, I have fulfilled the law and the prophets. And one of the ways that he expresses the way that he fulfills it is through his right teaching. If you've read the Old Testament and you've ever come to a portion of that scripture, the beautiful, wonderful, inspired word of God, and you've thrown your hands in the air and said, I just don't understand exactly what this is trying to get me to. I don't understand what God is pointing me to. I don't understand how does this part of the story make sense. I would ask you to start asking the question, how can this lead me to a closer and better knowledge of Christ. There's something that I'm missing. There's, there's types and shadows and mysteries in the Old Testament that Jesus Christ comes and begins to teach. And he begins to peel back the layers of the law so that what we see is that the law, in fact, was not simply about your external behaviors, but the law was about your heart. The law was intended to draw you into an understanding and a knowledge of your sin and point you in the direction of God, the only one who could righteously fulfill it. And in fact, the third and final, and, and really if we walk away this morning with no other understanding of how Christ fulfills the law, but this one, we must take this one home. Christ fulfills the law by fulfilling the righteous requirements of the law both through his, his active and his passive obedience, his active obedience in the way that he led his life according to the law. He obeyed the law. He perfectly followed the law in every way. And in his passive obedience, allowing himself to be led to the cross where he would fulfill not only the aspects of the law that were required of him as a person, but he would actually go to the cross and give his life in perfect obedience to God the Father, in order to fulfill the law and the righteous requirements of the law on our behalf, that we might have salvation, that we might be freed from sin. Romans 5.19 says, For as by one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Meditate on this question as you leave here today. Whose record of obedience do you want to stand on? When the final judgment comes, when the Lord returns, or when you're called home, whose record of obedience will you stand on? When you stand at the gates of heaven, if someone stands there before you and says, what gives you the right to enter this place, what will your answer be? I promise you it will not be on any merit that you may have garnered by external obedience to any kind of word or law, the only thing we'll have left to plead will be that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior, and He said we could come. Let's pray. Father, thank You this morning for giving us breath in our lungs to sing praises to You. Thank You for giving us Your holy, perfect, and inspired Word. It is wonderful from beginning to end and it guides us and directs us and teaches us. But we know that only by the power of your Holy Spirit will it be made transformative to us. So we plead with you. By your Spirit's power, would you cause this to change our hearts, change the way we think, give us new perspectives where they're needed. And God, let us be considered to be a radical generation of people who follow so closely after Christ that we walk in his footsteps that we crucify our sinfulness in our lives for your glory and your power forever and ever. Amen.